So, hello everybody. It's been so amazing, right? We've had such an amazing, amazing time. Um, and I want to kick off today's general session. I'm so happy to have you all here and, and special it? guests who are here with us today. Very, very happy to have you. Um, I want to kick off today's general session by talking to you about boredom. Now, boredom is an emotion that many of us have experienced in our life at one time or another. It's actually probably something that every single one of you has experienced at some point or another in your life. Basically, it's the kind of thing, boredom is the kind of thing that you really can't get away from boredom no matter what it is that you do. And we all have those experiences as children, right? Where long stretches of time, where you know, we don't connect with anything. And boredom is itself sort of defined as the experience of where your brain believes there's no new stimulus to process around you, and so effectively it stops processing new stimuli. And that's the state of boredom. Now, interestingly, in most of the animal kingdom, boredom is a state that then produces sleep. Because, hey, we could always catch up on more sleep, and if you have a dog or a cat, you know what 18 hours a day of sleep looks like. For many humans, that too is the response to boredom, but humans don't always respond this way to boredom. They don't always go to sleep when they feel bored. Um, now, with advanced brain imaging, we actually have some data and we have some information about what happens to the brain during this state of boredom. And in fact, we kind of had it all wrong. It turns out that a brain in a state of boredom actually processes about 95% at the same rate as 95% of a brain in active waking time. Much like we misunderstood deep sleep, right? It's very similar to deep sleep. We used to think that deep sleep was the brain shut down completely, but actually it processes information at almost the same rate as being awake. And so the new prevailing theory is that this state of boredom, that boredom itself, is a time when we process things just like in our states of deep sleep. But over the years, we've developed a kind of a rejection to boredom or a resistance to boredom. And in fact, it's, it's borne out well in the evidence. St. Jerome, many of you might know, famously said, idle hands are the devil's playground or workshop or whatever. We have for a very long time believed that boredom was a bad thing. We've often thought it was a really bad thing. And in fact, there's all this science that says it really is. Boredom is closely correlated, closely identified with acting out, antisocial behavior, overeating, smoking, doing terrible things. And so we thought that boredom is bad for a really long time. Demonstrating the power of the free market, companies, organizations have stepped into that gap and created an economy based around solving boredom. And primarily, you think of the entertainment industry for that, right? I mean, this is an ages-old industry, you know, theater and writing and so on, aimed to solve our boredom. There is money there in solving people's boredom and taking them out of boredom. But I started to think about it, and I was like taking a step back and a step up and stepping up and stepping up and looking at it. And I started to think, you know, it's not just entertainment that aims to solve our boredom. I mean, the food industry, sex, home improvement, child rearing. And so, in many ways, you could say we actually live in a boredom-based economy. I don't know what percentage of the economy is attributed to solving people's boredom, but I can tell you it's pretty significant. And the more you scratch the surface, the more you realize how much of our economy is actually tied up in solving people's boredom. So I started asking myself, you know, what is boredom? The scientific way of thinking about boredom is it's actually a, a concept, a phenomenon called habituation. And habituation is when you get a stimulus, you see a stimulus, and over time, that stimulus's effect on you diminishes. So basically, the same stimulus over time diminishes in, in efficacy. This is an important evolutionary dynamic in humans, because otherwise, you guys, think about what it would be like if we didn't have habituation. You would be constantly like, oh my god, that guy's voice is loud. This person smells. It's kind of cold in here, right? This idea of habituation allows us to take all this external stimulus and turn the volume down on it so we can focus on what's actually important. It's essential that we have this concept of habituation. But habituation is boredom. And what it means in practical terms, it means that things we used to think are cool aren't cool forever. That there's a point at which we may love this thing deeply and profoundly and meaningfully, and it might have a huge effect on us, and at some point we're like, that thing isn't cool anymore. Now, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, this research, some of you may know, this research not that long ago looked at 20,000 couples, longitudinal study, 20,000 couples. The researcher was interested in the transition from romantic affection to companionship affection. And basically, she found by looking at all these couples that at about mm, year two, the average couple shifts from 
romantic affection to companionship affection. So that is to say, for the first couple years, and, and not you guys, of course, because your relationships are not like this, <laughs> but the average American couple, you know, the, for the first two years, the average American couple's like, oh, yeah, good morning, baby. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. And then, like, around year five or six, you're like, cool, we're awake. So, um, so there's, like, this transition, right, from real excitement and enthusiasm to something more like companionship. And the researcher was trying to normalize this idea. She, she wasn't trying to make anybody feel bad about it. She was saying, this is pretty normal. This is the habituation to stimulus that happens over time. And even something like sex with somebody really super hot can turn into a habitual act. It can lose its efficacy. So the free market at work again, the food industry, understanding this really super well, is locked in an arms race with your senses. They understand this better than any other business. They are constantly turning the volume up on your senses, right? Bigger, better, saltier, fattier, sweeter. They get it. They know you get bored of their stuff pretty fast and they got to give you something new. And they have the luxury of being able to develop products and services along those lines. Other industries, like the entertainment business, are not so fortunate because their economics don't allow that. So what they end up doing is they end up coming up with a little formula that works, right? And then they repeat the same stuff over and over again, giving you 95% the same, 5% different. And reality programs like Kitchen Nightmares, which I actually enjoy to some extent, are my kind of litmus test for this. It's the same frickin' show week in and week out. Terrible owner of restaurant, intransigent, losing money, things are dirty. Gordon Ramsay, clean it up, shut it down, right? Restaurant owner, no way I won't. Then like family cries, oh, resolution, new menu, everything's great, right? Like, it's that same thing in every episode. Okay, thank you. I'm pretty good at reenactments, right? You should see my Civil War shit. Okay. So, so the entertainment business has to do this because it doesn't have the economics, traditional entertainment. But now, along come games. And the design of games is different. Because what's different about games from these other forms of entertainment, or even food for that matter, and even sex for that matter, is that games are designed to be adaptive to the player. The better you are, the better it gets. The better you are, the better it gets. And it's designed explicitly to adapt to you and keep you in a state that's less habituated, that's less bored for a longer period of time. And it does that through algorithms. It does that by focusing on the concept of flow, which many of you know work by Csikszentmihalyi, putting a user between a state of anxiety and boredom over a period of time. You lose sense of the world around you. You become one with that experience over that time. That's flow. And that's one of the things that games are good at doing. They're designed explicitly to put the user into flow. The other thing that games have done is they've leveraged artificial intelligence. When I, I did my undergraduate research in human intelligence, but I actually started off wanting to study artificial intelligence. And at that time, I thought I would have predicted, my, my um, professors would have told you, that we were going to use artificial intelligence for bigger things, right? Societal things, science things, uh, military things. But in the end, the free market again shifted the effort of AI from those kinds of subjects, where we still do AI research, but they're nowhere near as good as the AI that's gone into games. Games have become the leading edge of artificial intelligence research. And whether or not a game is capable of passing the Turing test, all that noise that came out this past week about a system pass supposedly passing a Turing test for the same time, I'd argue that maybe the Turing test is out of date. Because when you play a well-designed game, that computer opponent feels like a human. They're just as good at a, as the best human at playing against you. And we've seen that example with Watson and chess, right? We've seen that example for a, almost everybody. The machine is just as intelligent as a person. The amount of effort that's gone into that AI has been tremendous at dealing with our boredom. But the other transition that's occurred, which is equally important, is access. And this ubiquitous mobile technology has allowed us to transform our anti-boredom strategy from something that happens in big chunks of time, you know, meaning you go to your job and then you come home and you've got some bored time and you sit down and do something to alleviate your boredom, or you go from work directly to the theater and try to alleviate your boredom. Now, even if you're bored for like 60 seconds, you can pick up your phone and do something and immediately get some gratification for that one minute. So we're filling in all the cracks, and it's mobile technology that's really enabled us to do that. While all of this is going on, while this mobile games and gamification revolution is going on and conquering boredom over here, what's happening in the real world? What are our jobs still like? What are our interactions with the commercial world around us still like? 
What are our basic day-to-day -day activities like in terms of their ability to deliver on an anti-boredom promise? And I'd posit that if we plotted the line of what it looks like, what all the game-like experiences in the world look like in terms of their anti-boredom, anti-habituation power, and then we plotted the line of everything else in the world, our jobs, our work, our so on, that line looks pretty much flat. The amount of engagement inherent in the average person's job or the average person's interaction with the world around them in 2014 is the same as it was in 1954, and maybe even a little lower, actually, while the other side of the equation is off the charts. There are so many options at your immediate disposal in every way that are smarter and more adaptive. We're winning the war on boredom, just not without taking away from our real-world interactions. This is a practical outcome of this reality. So enter gamification and the people interested in gamification. One of the things that characterizes most of your work, not all of you, but most of you in the room, is you're attempting to bridge the gap between those two lines. If I could plot those two lines for you, you are the people trying to raise the line on the normal world shit. You're trying to pull that line up and make that line look more like the line of exciting game-like interactions that are you know, shaping our world and competing against habituation and boredom. And so it's very important to recognize that effort and what that effort actually means and represents. Now, conceptually, much of the stuff is not new. I've taken myself back to childhood again and thinking about long walks with my parents, right, from one place to another, which I'm sure were like three minutes long, but as a kid they seemed really long. Long walks with my parents, I mean, what did you do? You started to make a game out of it, right? Don't step on the cracks or step on the cracks. Don't, you know, step on the red stuff but not on the blue stuff. You know, we're constantly in that process. Our brains have always been wired to try to do that to the world whenever we felt bored. We tried to find an escape for that and tried to find an interaction, something we could master, something we could make fun and sort of interesting. I'm especially heartened in this transition, in this shift, by some of the things that people have been doing to transform their interactions with the world. So one of those things is homebrew gamification that parents have been doing. I've tweeted about it a little bit. I'm in love with it. Parents have been picking up this idea of game, gamified systems and applying them to parenting and saying, congratulations, you're grounded. Now you need to earn a certain number of points to get out of grounding, and you got to do these activities. And it's happening more and more, and it's really super exciting. But also, it's empowered an entirely new world of solvers, a whole new universe of people who can now access these tools and create amazing experiences that are gamified to solve problems, even if they're not you know, people with the tools at their disposal or those resources. And, and by one example, the young daughter of one of our attendees here, uh, Chuck Picklehaft, who's here, his daughter, uh, bookwormgame.com, she's built this gamified system to try to get people to read. And you can help contribute to their Kickstarter if you're interested by, by checking out that website. An 11, 12, 13-year-old kid doing this kind of stuff, this was inconceivable. Until recently, I said inconceivable, but I said it without a lisp. Inconceivable. Um, so, the, so the question becomes, so the question on all of your minds, I'm sure, many of you, and the question on the minds of many pundits and people who talk about this subject is, what are we losing? Because if we're gaining this one thing over here, we've conquered boredom, yay, boredom is dead, long live boredom, what are we losing? And I think many people, their immediate reaction to that is the contemplative nature of humanity. So what we're losing are those moments of silence and stillness that, note, were always imposed externally if we put it in this prism, right? So not the active choice, but the passive choice when boredom is foisted upon you. Those moments of stillness in which greatness occurs, in which we believe, and I think somewhat pathologically believe, that magical things happened in that time. Because we've been told stories that major things always happened in that time, and that time was magical and that's where things were created with little to no evidence to prove that that's actually the case. And so I'd say, I think when we make that argument, and not saying that it has no merit, but just in the way that I think about it, when we make that argument, I think we're also missing out on some other elements of non-boredom and how non-boredom or anti-habituation can be used to great effect for society and the world. And one of those things is the benefit of adrenaline. So adrenaline is actually potentially a good thing for helping people be creative and make good decisions. In recent research, we're finding at Washington University, St. Louis, people are actually happier and more creative when they make decisions, when they create things under pressure. They feel better about it. Some of you might know from your practice in gamification, I play games sometimes, right? The 312-2 game, if you've come to my play with the cause, play for a cause. What are we doing in there? We're setting a timer and we're forcing you to think about things and be creative with the timer, it turns out people like timers, and that makes them feel better. 
it makes them feel better to be under some amount of pressure to be creative. And there's also these great outlier stories, these amazing success stories related to that. And there's this kid, Griffin Sanders, whose story I absolutely love. So Griffin, a 10-year-old kid, lives in the suburbs of Denver, out for a drive one Saturday afternoon with his grandmother, 78 years old, and his younger brother, four years old. They're out on the freeway. They're going full speed on the freeway, and grandma has a heart attack. And she slumps over the front of the car, slumps over the steering wheel, and in seconds, in seconds, Griffin dra- grabs the steering wheel of this car, navigates through traffic, because the car started to drift into oncoming traffic, navigates the traffic, and puts the car down on the side of the road, safely. No, no accidents, no injuries. Just like you would have done, right, at 10? I'm sure you would have been just as good at this, right? So the, cops, so the cops come, he then picks up the phone, calls 911. The cops come and they're like, oh my God, what happened here? And he's like, Mario Kart. And they were like, what? And he said, no, no, no. And he said, he said, he thought it was a test from the game. He actually saw it. When it happened, he was like, oh, this is a challenge in Mario Kart. Right? It's an outlier. It's an outlier. But it's an interesting observation about creativity and thinking on your feet and fluid intelligence and the effect of games and timing and pressure and adrenaline, right, on how it is that people act and how they interact. But it's also true that these game-like anti-boredom experiences have the benefit of being able to be more longitudinal than that moment of stillness, that single moment of stillness, yeah? So they can encourage us to repeat our behaviors and enhance our behaviors and raise them up and achieve mastery and go on a journey towards doing something because it often takes many steps to get to a journey. Rather than things happening in one immediate fell swoop, it often takes us time to get somewhere. And games are uniquely good at helping us push ourselves forward and these gamified experiences are. This is especially important, you guys, because it turns out that we've solved all the easy problems in the world. There are no more easy problems left, you guys. There just aren't any. None of us in this room, no matter how bright, are going to sit in a room by ourselves and in one minute or even a day or an hour or a year solve a major problem. Because let me tell you what, even if you came up with the solution in your head, nobody is going to believe your solution until it's built, until it's engineered, until it's tested, until it's tried out. And as soon as you start down the process, other people will try. There is an entire world of engineering and science that must be there to support your idea coming to fruition. It's not like the olden days where you could just create a flying machine and try it out yourself. You saw that in the XPRIZE example, right? Think about it. Great solvers from an outside community, but they needed the test bed. Someone needs to give them money to build a spaceship. That's the kind of stuff we've got to solve now. And so gamified applications like Foldit, which you know, or Eterna, which maybe you don't, leverage the power of all of these people to really collect their intelligence and achieve something that no one person could achieve, no matter how many silent still moments you might have in that time. For example, in the case of Eterna, getting tens of thousands of people together for a better way of understanding the structure of DNA and RNA. The other thing that these kinds of experiences do is they bring sunshine into something. They bring sunshine, which means they bring opposing viewpoints. They bring other ideas. They allow some light to shine on something so that it can grow, so that it can be better. And LiveCube is always my favorite example of this, right? The first year, if you were here at G-Summit a couple of years ago, we ran LiveCube, our amazing live event application for gamification, and it was like a total bomb that first time around. We had all kinds of technical problems, right? We we couldn't get our stuff together. It was the first time we were really trying it with a big group of people, but people saw a glimmer in that. And just like the young gentleman who was up here before, we got a lot of feedback from a large group of people who told us, hey, you should go at it, and we said, let's persevere, and we tried again, and we got more feedback, and we kept at it, and we kept at it, and it culminates in the amazing space race that you all just played, which finally worked and was amazing. But it's this sunshine and iteration that allows us to get to somewhere more meaningful and allows us to actually fulfill our promise, our destiny, making the world a better place. Not to be outdone, not to be outflanked for one second, is also the importance of fun, which often gets lost in our conversation, especially in our daily conversation. How important is fun? Why is fun important? And one of my favorite examples of this is the app Tinder, which many of you might know is a dating app. So right now on the app Tinder, uh, this day on the app Tinder, they will process, so it's a dating app where you swipe left or right if you like someone, it's like hot or not with a finger swipe. Okay, today, 750 million swipes will be recorded on Tinder, and 10 million matches between people will be made. This app is like a year old, you guys. 
and has eaten a giant chunk out of the dating market really quickly because of one core observation about the founders. If you talk to them, you listen to them. Dating is a game. And dating can be fun. Okay? This can be fun. This is a game. This is easily adapted to this idea. And the concept of fun, when presented in this way, can be incredibly powerful. For those of you who've used it, you'll notice that it act they actually use even game-like language in Tinder to get you to go, right? Keep playing, for example, in the, in the parlance of this idea. Great, Gabe, fun, blah, blah, blah. We're the converted, right? Fun is important. Fun is great. Ha, ha. We love fun. Yay. Okay. Ready? I got some science to drop on you people. Are you ready? I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to prove to you now with some evidence that after all these years of toiling away, saying that only, if we could only make people more happy in what they do, they would perform better. If we could only make things more fun, people would buy more stuff, be better humans, improve society. Everything would be better if everything was more fun. You've heard me say it a million times. Here's some evidence for you. Just published research three days ago from the Netherlands, really good double-blind controlled study looking at people who work out and dividing them into two groups, one who could have fun while they worked out and one group that just had to work out. And they did it by men and they did it by women. And guess which group lost more weight? The people who had fun. Unequivocally lost more weight. And the way they did it, and this is the funny part about it, is that the people who viewed working out as work, when they came back from a workout, they ate more. And the people who viewed working out as fun, they ate less. They had the option of eating whatever they wanted. And they demonstrably, if they thought it was fun, they demonstrably ate less by thinking that that thing was fun. You guys, it's real. And I know that Jane's going to come up in a, in a few minutes and she's going to talk and she's going to tell you about her evidence. So here's the cool part. The evidence is mounting that the stuff that we've talked about that our approach to these things is actually starting to bear fruit and is real. And you all know, those of you who've launched projects, that it's real, but now we're starting to see it, the power of happiness, the power of fun to transform people's engagement, to change the world. But as people who do this, as the folks in the trenches, you know that part of what you're doing, part of your mission, is to combat boredom. You're beating boredom back. Right? You're in a ground war against boredom. Use whatever metaphor you like. You're in a ground war against boredom, and you're winning because your idea is better than the other idea, because your way of engaging with the user is more fun than the other way. And so you're doing a better job because you're following these tenets, the three Fs, feedback, friends, and fun. You're doing these things, and you're gamifying them. But I just want to remind you that nothing lasts forever. And you know, but nothing is fun forever either. And that means that just the same way that you disintermediated other people's lives with your fun experiences, so too is everyone else in your category trying to take your time with the person, with the end user, away from you with something that's more fun and more engaging. And so, to a great extent, your job is to ensure that you never rest in this quest. And I'll tell you, that may seem daunting, but nothing that you make will ever be the absolute pinnacle of fun. None of us has the power to design the thing that is the maximum fun, like the moment at which the user just drops the mic and goes, that is it. I will never have a more fun experience than that. And I'm sure each one of you can think about a time in your life, right? Probably sex-related, but you can always think about a time in your life when you were like, that is the best, right? And then afterwards, you were like, oh, no, that was the best. And then, wow, that was the best, okay? So this is the thing, this is a never-ending progression in which the world gets more fun and more exciting. And I, for one, think that this is very, this is a tremendous opportunity. Some of you may feel like that's a burden, I'm layering something else on top of you. But I want you to understand, as gamification, as gamifiers, as we mature and we transition this fifth G Summit, as we're transitioning from a group of people who are like, I think this idea is cool, but I can't really prove it, to a group of people backed by a whole bunch of science, that our approach to combating boredom, that our anti-habituation strategies are actually working and organizations and governments are funding us to do these things, we must remain vigilant and we must be focused on the potential of our users. And that is, there is no maximum fun. Thank you.